Well, oh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, Spreckel die Deutsch 9, so nothing in German, please. Um, tonight's talk, which I hope will have a considerable amount of time for discussion before I have to rush over and catch trains and so on, is about the influence of German thought, or German language thought, in primarily English politics, English-speaking politics. That includes the United States. At the beginning of the 20th century, and I'm not going to get into the huge argument ever whether that's 1900 and 1901, the Daily Telegraph had massive front page, which was all about one thing, how Britain should be like somewhere else. And you might think, well, what country could they mean? Did they mean the United States, which had overtaken Britain in 1890 in industrial production and had higher living standards by 1900? No, no, America's not mentioned in the article at all. Britain must be more like Germany. That's what the entire article is about. And they're not talking about science. They're not talking about German contributions in chemistry or in physics or in mathematics. That's all completely ignored, or at least as far as I can remember, it's ignored. What they're talking about is politics. What Britain really needs is conscription and national insurance, by which they mean state welfare, which we did not have in 1900, and a whole string of other things that Germany, particularly Prussia, had pioneered, but these blessings had not yet reached us. And they should. And this was at a time when German output per man was actually half that it was in Britain. 50%. Completely ignored in the article. So, where did this come from? Did the editor of the Daily Telegraph just wake up one morning and have a fit? No. He was speaking what was almost the consensus of educated opinion, both in the Conservative Party and in the Liberals. Everyone wanted to imitate Germany, particularly Prussia, including the people who hated the place. It's a bit like Saruman in The Lord of the Rings, if any of you have come across that. He hates Sauron, but he wants to be like him. And they're both as bad as each other. So that is the conundrum you have to try and work out. Many years ago I wrote an article on Otto von Bismarck, because a lot of these ideas in practice, such as old age pensions, health insurance, that sort of thing, were pioneered by Bismarck. And showing the enormous influence of his example in the English-speaking world. It works. What Bismarck has done works. We must do it too. But it actually goes back a lot further than that. Now, the strength of Prussia that Bismarck exploited to become the dominant state in Germany and to unify Germany, finally ending up in 1871, was partly due to the fact that Prussia had gained huge areas of territory which weren't traditionally part of Prussia in the west of Germany, along the Rhine, the Rhineland, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Nothing to do with Bismarck. It wasn't born. Partly to do with various free market reforms, which had actually happened in Prussia in the early, very early 1800s. For example, the end of serfdom. Internal free trade. There was a period of time in Prussia in the early 1800s where Prussia had free market reforms. Again, nothing to do with Bismarck. This is all completely forgotten. What people see is the enormous strength of Prussia and then Germany. They attribute it to blood and iron. They attribute it to the state. Everything else is ignored. But there are reasons why it is. Bismarck and those who admire him are able to tap into a much bigger tradition. Going back to someone else who was wildly admired in England, 
Frederick the Great. Frederick the Great took a comparatively small nation and at one time was fighting Russia, the Habsburg Empire and France more or less simultaneously. Now, as an historical point, one could say, for example, if the Empress Elizabethia, great big blonde giant of a Russian, and her semi-sane Cossacks, if she'd lived a few months longer, history might not record Frederick as the Great, because they might have got into Berlin. But she died, and history is what it is. So Frederick is remembered as the man who took on everybody and won. In the dying days of the Third Reich, Hitler was comforted by saying, by people coming up to him and saying, we've been here before. The Russians at the gates, the Westerners coming at us as well. We triumphed before we will triumph again. It didn't quite happen, because no one actually died fortuitously at the right moment. Now, you will still find Frederick the Great admired in liberal circles now. For example, Niall Ferguson, Harvard historian, Scotsman, greatly admires Frederick the Great in his books. He will point to his religious tolerance, which is an old Prussian virtue going back to the first great elector. Won't mention it was based on religious indifference. And he will produce him as an example of liberalism, although the word was not used in the 18th century in a political context. But what is actually meant by Prussian liberalism in the time of Frederick the Great? It is enlightenment led by the state. It's enlightenment because it's intellectual. You know, he does more than lead armies, he reads books. He converses with Voltaire, he corresponds with Voltaire in French. He composes. He may not have liked Bach, but no one is perfect. He composes, has, you know, he's a composer, he knows other composers. He is a civilised man, he is a builder, he is a creator, he is a man of science. And this, to some people, not, I think, to the people in this room, is liberalism. The state using its power to enlighten the ignorant masses, to free them from religion, tradition, things like the common law. Because, of course... You have a corpus of law written by Frederick and his advisers telling you what the law is. And it's basically what he says it is. And that is an enlightened law. We don't need law to evolve. The state will tell us what it is, as opposed to it being found by disputes, contractual disputes and individuals. And he will bring this enlightenment to other people. For example, the Poles, by invading them and helping divide up Poland and make sure it does not exist, and counterfeiting their currency in order to finance his adventures, although now Ferguson forgets that bit. Now, neither does Frederick appear from nowhere. You have to try and grasp something which is the German academic tradition, which in the natural sciences is incredibly strong. That is why, for example, German was the language of science before 1914. Not English, not French, German. But the German academic tradition is not confined to science. It applies to everything. And it is incredibly thorough, traditionally speaking. It was summed up in a 19th century joke. Three men are asked to write a book on the elephant. An Englishman, a Pole, and a German. The Englishman writes a short book called The Elephant and How to Shoot Him. The Pole writes a book entitled The Elephant and the Polish Question. Pole's work's known for being rather interested in the national problem. And the German writes a three-volume epic entitled Preparations to begin the study of the elephant. <laughs> that sums up the German academic tradition, which is incredibly large, powerful, and impressive. If you, for example, get French statism, there's plenty of French 
straightism. The modern left bank stuff, I think you can sum it up. Um, what was how would how did um, how did that German philosopher sum it up? Oh yes, he summed it up as direct, which, which is um, German for excrement. And if you you know, try and read Sartre and so on, who were actually copying or trying to copy Martin Heidegger, you can see why he described their efforts that way, because they weren't rigorous. If you go right back to 18th century French statism, let's say to the Abbé de Marblay or to Rousseau, it reads like an inspiring speech. It's beautiful. It's like a speech you'd say on the, ga on the barricades. But it's not rigorous, it's not academic, it's not powerful. If you compare, let's say, the French socialists of the 19th century to Karl Marx, the French socialists probably sound better. <coughs> if they were delivering the speech. But they couldn't produce something that looked as impressive as the three volumes of Das Kapital. By the way, never attempt to read volume three. Wasn't intended for publication. Fred Ingalls published it anyway. So you have that tradition of rigor, scale, power. And that comes directly to the United States in the late 19th century via people like Richard Eli, who founded the American Economics Association and also the American Academic Freedom Campaign. Anyone know about Orwellian language? <laughs> the, per, the function of the, the Academic Freedom Campaign was to stamp out dissent, make sure that everyone agreed with Richard Eli and his friends. Uh, sometimes that was done by normal <coughs> academic means, sometimes it is alleged done by other means. If anyone wants to go home and likes conspiracy theories, Look up the mysterious death of Mary Stanford, the founder of Stanford University, who didn't like employing people who believed in essentially national socialism, state control, but also racialism. Um, she died mysteriously in a very opportune moment. So you have American academia consciously copying German academia. It's rigorous, it's large. They use long words, they can use mathematics. In economics, in the historical school, the great enemy of the Austrian school, people like Gustav von Schmaler, they stuff looks good, sounds good, is impressive. If you gave them an IQ test, way up. Give them a memory test, way up. They're intelligent, they have wonderful memories, they're incredibly hardworking probably have an ethical problem. But that, I would argue, and that's therefore disclosed my own bias, I take Karl Menger's line in the war of method between the Austrian school and the German historicists. And one of Karl Menger's charges, he did not make this at first, but he made this in 1883, in the errors of historicism, is if I translate from German academic language into English, you're bloody liars. You are prepared to say things you know not to be true because you are the intellectual bodyguard of the House of Hohenzollern, the Prussian ruling house, and you will say anything, literally anything, to support the state. In the United States, Horace Mann, the founder of Massachusetts Public Education, early 19th century. Richard Eli, late 19th century. In Britain... Both Joseph Chamberlain, unionist, never strictly speaking a conservative, but also many members of who, people who would call themselves conservative, <coughs> but also David Lloyd George. 1911, all these friendly societies and the clubs and stuff. Oh, this is so messy. We need national insurance. It doesn't matter that 80% of industrial workers are already members of friendly societies, mutual aid bodies fraternities. We don't want that. We'll con them. We'll pretend that the friendly societies will carry on as they are, but we'll put in this piece of legislation to subvert them over time. He also, by the way, added unemployment insurance, <coughs> which the Germans had not yet considered. But they had considered it, but had not yet done it. That comes in with the Weimar Republic. So you have <coughs> a whole massive tradition 
going back, if you want, into the 18th century, you can find people talking about alienation long before Karl Marx. You have this vast tradition and weight. Now, it's not everybody. I did actually, for example, mention those free market reforms in Prussia in the early 19th century. You can discuss people like Wilhelm von Humboldt and people of that sort. But you have an overwhelming preponderance on one side. You have people, for example, like Fecht. Fecht is a philosopher. He takes Kantianism to an extreme. Kant detests it because basically Fick says the universe is not real. At least that's Kant's interpretation of what Fick is saying. But for our purposes, we don't need to go there. Basically, what Fick is saying in politics is the state is everything. The state should represent the Volk. The Vothing should be outside the Volk. If you are outside the Volk, I don't care if you've lived here a thousand years, you're not a German. Because it's the blood and Bowden idea. But it's not <coughs> all that. You have some who don't do that. And some of them are not bad people. For example, one of the first great defenders of German nationalism, in an ethnic sense, was the philosopher Herder, who personally was charming, including to people of different ethnic groups. If you were a Jew or a Slav, Herder did not hold that against you. You were, you know, this wasn't your fault. Um, no, no, seriously. And he had no bad intentions towards you. <coughs> he just went to Germany, so. regardless of how long he'd lived there. <coughs> now, with international socialism, we have to go towards the Marxist tradition. Now, whereas my friends would point out that Karl Marx used racist language a lot, for example, denouncing his French socialist revival, uh, rival as the Jewish nigger, Karl Marx wasn't very good on self-awareness. <coughs> if you read, for example, on the Jewish question, it doesn't seem to occur to him that his own family were Jewish. Um, it doesn't fit in his brain. But it's not a major part of his theory. His theory is based on class, not on race. It's still collectivist. It's class collectivism, not racial collectivism. So you have one lot will go to the point of saying there's no universal principles, because of race, the other lot will say there's no universal principles because of class. <clears throat> that there is not, for example, no reason, no logic, which Kant had always defended. Universal logic, universal reason. Eventually, Germanic thought came to the conclusion that logic was either ethnic, there was Aryan logic, Jewish logic, or class, <coughs> proletarian logic, or capitalist logic. What von Ludwig von Mises called polylogicism, and he wasn't a fan. This became the dominant strain in German thought, anti-universalist. Had not always been so. But more importantly, from our point of view, it had this massive influence outside Germany. Both what you could call Reitig alienism collectivism top-down, and left alienism like Karl Marx, which is collectivism bottom-up, had massive influence outside Germany. Because, as I've already explained, it feels impressive. It looks impressive. If you get, let's say, an English status writer like Francis Bacon, you know, there's one, served James I, wrote a book called The New Atlantis, some standard collectivist utopia. The thing is, it's not going to convert people. It's not going... Someone picking up The New Atlantis is not going to say, right, I must have a revolution to create this system. It just feels like what it is. Some English bloke writing about how he'd like everything to be run by the state, particularly if he was in charge. And that's all it feels like. If you look at German statism, it feels profound. It looks profound, even translated into English. We, when we speak to Germans, I'm told sound trivial. It's just the way we are. We're like hobbits from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> That's how we speak. When a German speaks, they could be reading out the train timetable, and it sounds profound. It's just a cultural thing. 
But German academia and German academic rigor transforms that to a new level. And German success. Remember what I've already told you. Frederick the Great took on all the great powers of continental Europe and won. So he must have been doing something right. Leading liberals in Britain start to use the word state in a positive way in the early 19th century. People like Sir William Hamilton in Scotland, even John Stuart Mill in England. And they're thinking in terms of Frederick the Great, who died 50, 60 years before, because his memory. Bismarck is considered incredibly impressive. Bismarck unifies Germany, <coughs> makes it the most powerful nation in Europe. It's success. No one admired Louis XIV. A few lunatics, you know, like the, the person who built the, the fairy tale castle in, in, in Bavaria. He admired Louis XIV. But Louis XIV doesn't create a movement because he's a loser. Louis XIV tries to do various things in Europe and fails. Same as Philip II in Spain. No one takes the statism of Louis XIV of France or Philip II of Spain and says, this is wonderful. We should do this in England. We should copy them. We should do exactly what they do. No one. But Frederick the Great, yes. Bismarck, yes. Because they have the prestige of success and they have the prestige of German political thought, which is rigorous, profound, multi-volumed. People like Louis, um, you know, people like Louis XIV, <coughs> Philip II of Spain, all these other statists, they don't have that. It's just some bloke being a tyrant who would like to be like him. <coughs> anyway, shall we turn it over to questions now? By the way, at the moment, they're actually less statists than we are. Thank you.